Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. Each of us has been affected in some way by a diagnosis of cancer, whether it's ourselves, a parent, a child, a friend, or a colleague. When a doctor gives us the news, we are literally taken aback, and the chances are that we will embark on a road not willingly taken. Dr. Margaret I. Cuomo is a board-certified radiologist, and a large part of her practice was focused on the diagnosis of cancer and AIDS. What she wants is a world without cancer, and despite the wiliness and complexity of the disease, she believes it can be put out of business. She points the way to beginning that process in her new book, A World Without Cancer, The Making of a New Cure and the Real Promise of Prevention. It's just been published by Rodale Books. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. In 1971, President Richard Nixon declared a national war on cancer, signed the National Cancer Act, which in the following three decades put more than $1.5 billion into cancer research. There are now more than 260 nonprofits that are dedicated to fighting the disease. We have cancer walks, we have races for the cure, and yet cancer accounts for one in four deaths in this country. And 600,000 people, will, about that many, will die of that disease this year. Mm -hmm. What went wrong? Well, that's a very good question, and that's a question we struggle to answer. I will say that in the more than 40 years since President Richard Nixon declared that war on cancer, we have spent over $90 billion on cancer research. So we can say it's because we haven't dedicated the funding to wanting to end cancer. Or can we? Have we tried to prevent cancer? Or have we taken the road where we're looking for the breakthrough new treatment that will be perhaps uh, profit making instead of following the course that will end cancer through prevention? That's what I would advocate for. The rates for some cancers are actually up, correct? Yes. There are, in fact, the annual report to the nation on cancer was just released last week. And there are several cancers for men and women which are increasing at a uh, significant rate. And they include thyroid, kidney, pancreas, liver cancer, melanoma in men, uh, and uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma as well in women. So we have more work to do. When people are diagnosed with cancer, you often hear them and their doctors proclaim that they're going to beat it. We're going to beat this. Are there any cancers that are actually being cured? There are several specific examples, and there are only a few. One is chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML. And that is the uh, disease, the cancer, that Gleevec was the magic bullet for. Gleevec is, was the first, one of the first targeted cancer therapies that uh, was discovered. And it is essentially a cure for leukemia, CML. Why? Because CML is a rather simple cancer. And by that, I mean it has one specific genetic mutation that this uh, drug, Gleevec, targets. Most of the other cancers, which are more, much more common, like breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, prostate cancer, consist of many different subtypes, and they are several orders of magnitude more complex than that cancer. So for all of the common cancers, there are no cures. But there's a, there's a pretty good cure rate for, for early stage breast cancer, right? And sometimes early stage prostate cancer? Yes. Okay. You're absolutely right. It's all about finding the cancer early. Early detection is still the key. How about cancers like colon cancer? pancreatic cancer, lung and liver cancer. Are there really any cures for these even if diagnosed early? You know, it all depends. That, that's not a simple question uh, to answer because it depends on the specific type of the cancer and each of them have subtypes. It depends on the stage at which you find it. So uh, depending, if you find, let's say, a specific kind of breast cancer early, yes, it can be cured. Uh, or prostate cancer for that matter. But it all depends on the characteristics of the cancer. Okay. 
Almost every month, one reads or hears a news story about some new breakthrough in cancer treatment, a new drug or procedure that supposedly has great potential for prolonging or saving the life of cancer patients. It gets a big decision. It's on the front page of the New York Times. They cover it on the evening news. Then one learns that in the clinical trials, the treatment extended patients' lives only about two or three months. Mm -hmm. So what are doctors doing when they put patients through this often grueling and highly expensive course of treatment, which you refer to as the cut, poison, and burn approach to treating cancer. So what are they doing? Well, doctors are following their mission, which is to save human life. And in the course of that, oftentimes, as you say, any treatment is offered to the patient, even though it will not extend overall survival, it will ex extend what we call progression free survival, a number of weeks or months during which the tumor will not expand rapidly. That's not the same as extending your life. Survival is how long you live. Right. And so we need a, a shift. We need a shift in the way doctors approach patients, how they inform them of their prognosis, and allow a doctor to make those uh, choices available to patients. That's not taking away their option to live. It's allowing them to live with dignity and with reality in mind. It seems to me, and your book sort of seems to support my thesis, that there's a kind of cancer treatment, I'm gonna call it racket, that's being promulgated by the pharmaceutical companies, by doctors and medical institutions on people who are desperate to survive. Is that an overstatement? Well, if you are a cancer patient, you, in most cases, want desperately to survive, to live for yourself, for your family. So yes, there is that appeal that, look, the chances are that you'll live a few months, but who knows, maybe you'll be that one patient in a million that's going to live more than that. That's the kind of uh, rationale, I think, that is offered to patients. And that's where I think we can do a better job in the medical community of offering practical and realistic and more helpful uh, choices to patients. And, and I, I think it's that doctors should be more honest with their patients about their likelihood of being cured, about the reality of what the, the treatments can mm -hmm. actually do for them. Yes. All I'm trying to say is that in many cases, the, pa the doctor is so uh, dedicated to saving human life at all costs. We have to realize that even if you have medical insurance, there is no way the treatment can be covered completely. Someone is paying for that, and we all are paying for that. You know, those costs are filtered down through the government to us, so we all bear the burden of cancer treatment as a society. And unfortunately, Cheryl, it is unsustainable. We cannot keep going the way we are going and expect our economy to support it. How much are we paying on cancer treatment and diagnosis a year? It's already at this point, since 2010, it's been about 18 percent of the gross domestic product. It is, it is estimated that if we continue at the current rate, it will be at least 20 percent of the gross domestic product by the year 2020. And a figure of what? Uh, it's, it's billions. Okay. You know. <laughs> um, what do you think of, of TV ads for places like Cancer Centers of America? Well, I, I'm really not that familiar with them. Uh, you know, there was a time when doctors used to say, and I remember that even uh, when I was in training, doctors would say, our, our superiors would say, we're not in business. Doctors don't advertise, and uh, you know, this is a calling. This is not a business. Well, times have changed, haven't they? Doctors advertise, and now cancer centers advertise. I don't think it's harmful to uh, allow the public to know what's available, but it, it, it seems like it's a little diminishing to the overall practice of medicine. We talked about the role that uh, doctors and pharmaceuticals, well, a little bit about the role that doctors and pharmaceutical companies play in this relentless quest for, to, you know, for a cure or extension of a few months or a year. Do the government and the insurance companies also play a role in promoting this unsustainable, not necessarily helpful culture? Well, yes, because the pharmaceutical companies set the prices, of course, for their medications. Uh, there is no value element 
in this process. We are the only nation in the civilized world that doesn't have a value element, as a matter of fact. England does, as you probably know. And by value element, you mean, explain that. I mean a cost that is reasonable to be absorbed, not just by the public, but also by the government through insurance, through Medicaid and Medicare. So, you know, there, there are very little restrictions on what a pharmaceutical uh, company can charge. So if they charge $100,000 for a course of treatment, and they have done so for certain medications, well, how, how is society to sustain that? But there's also not just re not restrictions on value in terms of cost. There's also not restrictions on value in terms of effectiveness, correct? Whether drugs are really effective. No. No. The, the FDA does monitor that. Oh, and do that. Fact, okay. There have been examples like Avastin is one glaring example where it was created for treatment of ovarian cancer and then there were trials that showed it was effective for breast cancer. It was approved by the FDA. The FDA actually rescinded its approval for the treatment of breast cancer with Avastin because it was shown in trials that it really didn't do what it was supposed to do. So we do have some monitoring of that at least. The cost, I mean, talk about the cost of these drugs. Because Avastin was, what, like $100,000? Approximately that, a yes. A year? Yes, that's right. And there's no way, that's why I say, we all absorb that cost. That cost filters down to each and one of us as taxpayers. So that's why there have to be some breaks on the system. I will tell you there is a ray of light because just in the past year, uh, there was a drug that came before consideration for uh, uh, use by the patients of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, the physicians there made a groundbreaking decision not to accept it because it was more expensive than another drug which was shown to be just as effective. And so they rejected that. That was the very first time Memorial Sloan Kettering had ever done that, and I applaud them, and hopefully it will set a trend for other major cancer centers in our country that, uh, you know, we won't accept, they won't accept any drug that comes along for their patients, that it has to be reasonable uh, in cost and it has to be effective. Bone marrow uh, transplants. Well, you don't say a lot about it in your book, no, no. but is that an area that is, in, in your view, is used too much or pursued in some cases where it shouldn't be? Honestly, I'm not an expert in that field. Uh, it, it all depends on the kind of cancer. Uh, the patient has to be well informed with the statistics. What is the evidence? How many patients have survived? Uh, what are my chances of survival with this treatment? It's a grueling treatment, as you know. Right. And uh, so it all depends on the particular circumstances. We're going to take a short break. Then we'll be back with more with Dr. Margaret Cuomo after this message. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY Leads. CUNY Leads to the career I always wanted. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York. I'm talking with Dr. Margaret Cuomo, author of A World Without Cancer, the making of a new cure, and the real promise of prevention, which has just been published by Rodale Books. I didn't realize until I read your book that oncologists earn a profit from the drugs that they prescribe, which seems like a, a kind of conflict of interest, you know, in the whole treatment scheme. Well, let's qualify that. That's oncologists in private practice, not hospital-based uh, oncologists. They would justify it by saying they have to purchase it. Their services are required to pass it on. I believe there are guidelines for that within their specialty of oncology. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. What would be the alternative? That they would have to give it to their patients at cost, right? So, you know, this, this is something where... But, but you suggest that there's a built incentive to prescribe the more expensive drugs. Correct. Because you make more yes, money. Yes, there's no... I mean, the evidence would show that, that where government, uh, you know, insurance funding for certain chemotherapeutic agents had decreased, the oncologists in private practice would use the more expensive 
uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So that is something that we are aware of and should be monitored. We've been talking about problems with the treatment side. What's wrong with the, with the research side of cancer culture? I mean, you suggest that it is uncoordinated. Everybody's out there on their own, often competitive, not working together. When you examine how many agencies, I mean, it's mind-boggling how many institutes, agencies, departments, even the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy have budgets for cancer research in our country. It's a very divergent kind of a system. And that doesn't include all of the university centers across the country. And what many uh, experts said to me is, we need more collaboration, meaning we need more focus on our goals, specific goals with specific timelines, uh, and bring the best minds together, not just domestically within our own country, but internationally the way we did for other major projects in our country. Like the Manhattan Project and Correct. Uh, the Human Genome putting a man Project on the moon. and putting a man on the moon. That was all very focused, very team oriented. We have yet to do that for cancer. And right now you have all of these researchers working in their little rabbit warrens. But if a doctor, you know, a, there's no comprehensive database so that a doctor could find out how certain treatments have worked on patients who have certain kinds of diseases in certain stages and say, well, I'll try this because it worked over there. But, this, yes. but, but they tried to put together such That's a database right. and it didn't happen. That's right, Cheryl. In a world without cancer, I go into great detail on a project that is known as CA Big. It was the uh, bioinformatics information uh, grid that was supposed to coordinate all of the various information data nationally across the country. And $350 million was spent on this project. It was ultimately halted. They put a moratorium on it because of, uh, let's say, uh, inefficiency of planning of this project. It didn't accomplish what it was supposed to. And that's a pity. We still have a large gap. We still don't have that a central database that we so desperately need, and I hope that they'll get that project back, back on track, uh, watching very closely what its goals are, because we need it. We need that kind of uh, sharing of data. And among your recommendations for changing the cancer culture is just that, creating a more effective mm -hmm. system for researchers and doctors to share information. Also, you recommend creating a National Cancer Prevention Institute uh, to target cancer prevention exclusively. How would that work? Well, again, it would have a very focused, collaborative, team science approach. And I would recommend, as I mentioned in the book, dividing that uh, National Cancer Prevention Institute into specific organ systems. So you have the breast team, you have the prostate team, you have the lung team. And set your goals, set your timeline, and see what you can accomplish in that way. Perhaps to reduce the cancer rate or, or to reduce the death That's rate right. by a certain Percentage a by a certain deadline. By a certain date. At least you have a goal. Right now, there is nothing to compel a certain scientist to reach a specific goal in a spe specific time frame, and nobody is setting those goals. So I think it's time for a change, and there are many experts across the country that agree. You also want to change the emphasis from research. Not that you would stop, you know, mm -hmm. research, but change the emphasis put more resources into prevention. Yes, and I state very emphatically in the book, this is not a competition uh, for prevention against treatment. We have the intellectual resources, the talent, and the finance finances in this country, God bless America, to do both. I'm asking for a more balanced approach. Why should there be only 2% of the vast National Cancer Institute budget dedicated to prevention? and the remainder to treatment. You know, it just doesn't, it's not a balanced approach and it's not what we need. Even the report of the National Cancer Institute and the President's Cancer Panel has said that prevention has led to some of the greatest strides we've made in cancer to date. So let's try to focus more of our talent and our resources to prevention. You talk about a government-funded campaign to promote healthy lifestyles, mm -hmm. but it, it seems to me you know, it seems that I hear a lot about 
you know, read about it, stories about it, you know, uh, you know, what a healthy lifestyle is. I think I know what a healthy life, what I'm supposed to eat, what I'm supposed to do, whether I do it or not. Uh, don't people already know what a healthy lifestyle is? I think there's still a great deal of ignorance. And, and by the way, I want to say I applaud Mrs. Obama. She's trying very hard with her Let's Get Moving campaign and trying to instill healthier eating and greater physical activity. I think a lot, much, a lot more can be done, and I think that program needs a lot more support. I also think industry has to cooperate. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you look at breakfast cereals that our children and adults are eating, or what is served Which are in, full of sugar. They are, and other chemicals that are not beneficial to our health. Uh, also, you know, in, in uh, chains of, of coffee vendors across the nation, I don't want to mention any names. We know what they are. We love their coffee. We love their products. Let them step up and decrease the, the fat content and the salt and sugar content in these products. How can America uh, get on track if there are so many temptations and, and so many pitfalls along the way? It's very difficult if you're a working person uh, or a child and you, you're not given the proper food. And yet when somebody like Mayor Bloomberg, you know, proposes healthy initiatives, you know, riding trans fats, sugary drinks, calorie posting in restaurants, banning smoking in public places, um, banning the sale of big, big, big sugary drinks, uh, making fresh, pro more fresh produce available, he gets criticized as being, trying to be our nanny. <laughs> well, I applaud him. He has set the standards high in New York. He is protecting the health of its citizens. Uh, there's much more that could be done, but you're right. With trans fats, with decreasing the size of uh, sugary drinks that can be bought at any one time, all of these measures are, are steps in the right direction. You know, it's not, that e it's not that difficult, excuse me, to lead a healthy lifestyle if we put our minds to it. It's, it's looking at your daily plate and saying two-thirds of this plate is going to be vegetables, fruits, whole grains. Just a sliver of that pie that my plate represents is going to be protein, whether it's fish, chicken, and once in a blue moon, I can have some red meat. Not every day, because that, that increases your risk for cancer. So if we give ourselves the tools, we can apply them. So you talk about, you know, uh, what, what individuals can do in terms of diet to reduce um, uh, the likelihood of getting cancer. What are some of the other things that you would recommend individuals to do? Other things, and, and this is uh, for all of us, adults and children, build more physical movement into your daily life. Does that mean I have to go to the gym every day? Well, if you can afford to do so, by all means. But it also means for the rest of your day and for the rest of us, take the stairs instead of the elevator or escalator. Walk a few blocks to your next appointment. Park farther away from the supermarket or wherever you're going and walk a few extra blocks. You know, be conscious of trying to move more during your daily routine, and that will go a long way, too. Limit Vitam vitamin D and calcium. Vitamin D Who is Who knew? Essential. I didn't. Okay. But I didn't know. Very important, and we're all vitamin D deficient. I mean, the, the, it's an epidemic across the country. All it takes is a blood test when you go for your annual physical. Ask your doctor, could you please take the blood you've taken from me already and run it also for vitamin D level. You should be between 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. I have it in a world without cancer. And then depending on your blood level, you will know with your doctor's uh, guidance how much vitamin D to take every day. Vitamin D boosts your immune system and it helps reduce your risk for cancer. You fault doctors for not telling their patients not to smoke. I can't believe that they're not telling their patients not to smoke well, or that they're not telling their patients that they need to, should get their weight under control. It has happened. I, I have uh, evidence of it that doctors who are dealing with patients in end-stage disease have said to me, you know what, let them smoke. It's not going to make any difference. Well, well does it make a difference it in end-stage? It does. It, the smoking does make a difference to the way that they are receiving the treatment, and it's still going to degrade their overall uh, state of being. So. No, uh, doctors have to remain ethical. Would, would it be ethical for a doctor not to give blood pressure medicine to a person whose blood pressure was too high? Of course not. So we have to remain consistent with what we want people to do. Smoking is a no-no. Do you see any movement? We talked about Mayor Bloomberg, but do you see movement towards the kinds of reforms that you are calling for in your book? 
I do. I, I mean, we're in New York State right now. Uh, they have the Fresh Connect program, and they're expanding that to bring uh, fresh farm produce from New York to areas what we call food deserts, uh, where you know you have just a bodega in your neighborhood. You never see anything green. That's going to change. That has changed already, and it's going to be expanded. I see school cafeterias, many of them, trying to make a difference to their students teaching them about vegetables. Man, many children don't even know what certain veg, well, vegetables are. I never saw an eggplant, never saw a head of broccoli. Let's teach them. In many cases, the students can be the teachers of their parents about healthy living. Uh, so I see that, and I see that in many offices, uh, their workers, their employees are being given an opportunity to get out, take walks during the day, uh, even take naps during the day, power naps to restore their energy and well-being. And I applaud all of that. So we can do it if we work together. So I gather there's going to be another book that pursues this line of, of, of thinking. Yes. Uh, talking about another book now that would give people a practical guide on how to implement some of these strategies into their daily lives. OK. Well, we're going to look forward to, to reading that one. Okay. We're out of time. My thanks today to Dr. Margaret Cuomo for joining me. A World Without Cancer the making of a new cure and the real promise of prevention has just been published by Rodale Books. None of us can afford to ignore her knowledge and passion for change in the way we approach the disease. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.